All right. So we're going to dig into the physical layer and kind of how, you know, under the hood of our FID. Last time we talked through what the con what it was used for and kind of how the data flow in our FID worked. Uh, before we start, a reminder, uh, I have a conference that has to be at. It's on campus, but it falls right on top of this, so we're not going to be meeting Friday. Um, what I'm going to do is go ahead and put up the you know exercise. I'll probably break it into a couple of pieces on this and then the quiz for this area. I'm also going to get you to read um, the chapter for the next section. We're going to start in on 802.11. So I'm going to get you to read that uh, before Monday, but I'll get all that uh, put up for you. So Anyway, last time we talked about um, how we use our, you know, ID, what kind of applications you use for. We talked a little bit about the uh, data frame and what kind of information can be stored with it and a little bit, little bit about applications. Today I want to talk about, <laughs> no, no, we're through. There we go. <laughs> I want to talk about how the physical layer on this actually works. Now, if you think through that list of applications we've talked about, you know, everything from tags that are in books that you walk through a bookstore with to tags that are built into a credit card that you read to tags that are inserted under the skin, you know, either on humans or on animals to tags that are put on pill bottles. All of those use the same fundamental technology but let's think about it from a radio point of view. In some situations, I don't need to transfer a lot of data. And I don't need to transfer it far. You know, For example, at one end of the spectrum, your book talked about something called one-bit tags. You ever seen the little adhesive kind of rectangular white blocks that are stuck inside products when you get them? That's a one-bit thing. And what happens when they turn that off is they turn off the transponder for it going through the gate. It literally has one bit that is purchased or not purchased. That's all the information there is in it. Um, the middle ground on that is having just that product code and serial number and all of that coded. So maybe I need that information to start a warranty system if I buy you know, a piece of electronic gear or something, I'll read that off of the RFID tag. If I'm trying to tag cattle, for example, let's say I put a tag in their ear. Well, yes. I'm sorry. I think they use those uh, the phone lines yeah. and the tracking system. Mm -hmm. mm. For miners? Yeah. Yeah, so what would, what would the physical requirements, if I'm going to track miners, first off, what, why am I tracking miners? Yeah, I want to know it's a dangerous environment. I want to know who has gone into the mine, and I want to make sure they've all come out at the end of a shift. So what are, from a point of view of how much data we're talking about, how much data do we need to uniquely identify one person? Not a lot. I mean, you know, you, you, you're probably going to code more than just, you know, a serial number for a person. But I could have, you know, which mine it was, what shift it was. You know, I don't, I don't know what they, what they record for that. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. So if 20 went in, do I have 20 out of that room? Right. Is, is, is there somebody still in there or is there not? So with that in mind, how, would I, how could I manage that with RFID? We're not talking about a lot of data, right? Remember, RFID 
works because I have some I have that RFID tag physically associated with whatever I want to track. In this case, it would be a miner. So maybe I put and I know I'm oversimplifying things, <laughs> but maybe I put a reader on the entrance to a mine. As I go through, it reads that I've gone in. When I come out, it reads that I come out. I could extend that. And I'm not a miner, so I'm going to make up a situation that may or may not apply. If I had branches underneath, I could track where people are by which gates they've gone through. So that you know, would be a way to do it. Good example. How far are we going to have to transmit data in that situation? Probably a few feet. You know, we'll set up a gate, uh, a reader around a doorway, an entrance. And you read through, so it'd be similar to walking through a doorway. So we're talking what, meter or two? So moderate distance for this technology. Remember, this is very low power stuff we're talking about. The reason I'm going through all that is there are actually several frequency ranges that are used by RFID, and you choose the frequency range of the system depending on what you're trying to accomplish. For example, we have a range down in the low frequency. Remember, we looked at those LF, MF, HF, different ranges earlier. Well, there's, there is a uh, frequency that's commonly used, 135 kilohertz, or right around 135 kilohertz. They actually vary slightly depending on the system. That is in that low frequency range. The advantage of lower frequencies like that is they tend to go through water and stuff like that easier. The disadvantage is they don't propagate very far. So this is going to be a very close-in technology. Why would I be concerned about going through water? What kind of situation would I have that might be a problem with water? I'm sorry? I'm not, I'm not following you. I'm sorry. I think it's signal loss. Signal loss in water is greater. Um, lower frequencies propagate through water with less loss than higher frequencies. So the low frequencies work in there, but what situation, where would water be a problem? Remember, this is very, very low power stuff. I'm mostly made of water, as are most animals. So if I'm putting something that is a tag that I inject in an animal, you're actually reading that through water. And even though it's fairly close to the surface, it's enough to cause a problem when you get up in the microwave range. You know, hairs on your arm, cells, water molecule, or water um, in your veins, all of that is significant in terms of wavelength at higher frequencies. At lower frequencies, it's not. And so it, it, you can, the signal propagates better. As we move up, We've got, there are actually several defined, your book lists one, and the most common frequency used is 13.56 uh, uh, megahertz in the high frequency range. You go on up, there are UHF frequencies. You go further above that, you get SHF, 2.4 gig and 5.8 gig. And then they actually define one way up at 24 gig. The trend as you move up that is that I can move more data, and it'll actually travel a little further through air. The reason is this: the antennas that I can use for this become more efficient as I get higher in frequency because I can use, I have more of a wavelength, and I can intercept more signal. This way it is the the simple version of looking at it. So we're going to choose a frequency range based on how far I have to propagate that signal and how much data I have to move. And it's, it's a continuum. You, you look at the specs depending on what you're trying to accomplish. Um, when we read the, oh, I'm sorry. So if we're talking about passive tags and active tags, of course, have the advantage that I can actually use a little more power. I don't have to. I don't have to couple the power from the reader. So for passive tags, which is what kind of sets the limit on this, if we're using low frequency, you're looking at 50 centimeters, so 
what, 20 inches thereabouts. Those are the kind of things that you would use for that embedded reader on animals. First off, that frequency is going to pass through skin and tissue well. Second, I can walk up with a handheld reader. They look like wands. And I just wave it over that site and it'll read, it'll excite the tag and read it. We'll talk about how it does that in just a second. Uh, some of them, if you're reading more data and you need a stronger signal, they actually have a loop. And for example, you'd stick your arm through it. That captures more signal the way it couples. And again, we'll look at that in a second. So for those kind of applications, very, you know, pretty short range, low data rate, but we have to be able to penetrate uh, in uh, water or water containing things, we're going to use it low frequency. High frequency, maybe I need uh, building access control, something that works out to about three meters. You know, I don't, it, we talked about the subway pass, you know, where I can walk by. I talked about my son who had a, a pass for the DC subway, and he doesn't even take it out of his pocket. You know, he just kind of does the hip bump and the gate opens. It's pretty neat. If, you do, if you're not expecting it to happen, it's a little unnerving the first time you see it go. And then you realize that all these people are kind of going by and they go, boom, flop. It's pretty funny to look at. Anyway, Washington's funny anyway. But what you're talking about there, again, is not a lot of data, but think about what that kind of system is doing. This is a card that I purchased. It's a prepaid card. So I can handle that a couple of ways. If I buy it on a yearly basis or a six-month basis, then I'm going to put, I'm going to store the date that that expires, the date that it's no longer valid, as a part of that tag. And so I can build into that gateway, read the tag. If it's past this date, don't open the gate. I can put a declining balance on that. Yeah. That's actually probably a different one, but you're, 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 you're right. What have we changed there? Now, instead of just reading data off a tag, I'm making a way to write data to the tag. Now, we're not going to go into the electronics of that, but there are tags that you can write data to. And there are applications where you want. For example, back to the animals for a second. If I'm running a cattle operation and using RFID tags to track the cattle, I might want to store information about that animal periodically that travels with that animal. <laughs> you know, in addition to its identity, maybe I want to know its birthday. Maybe I want to keep its weight records with me. Vaccinations. Any of those kind of things. So I could store that. Uh, in the case of the building access or subway access control gates, if I had a declining balance, I'll put $50 on this card, and that sets the original amount, maybe. And as I go through the gate, it will deduct that from 50 and write the new balance on my card. And then, you know, if I try to go through and I don't have enough balance to cover that trip, it won't let me through. Pretty neat. A lot easier than waiting in line at a window with a person to buy a ticket to go through and do all that. So those are the kind of things that you can look at doing this with. So for HF, three meters, you know, those kinds of things like walking through a toll gate, we use it down the hall. If you ever go downstairs to information systems, they have RFID access doors. They use similar technology, and it's keyed to their identity on the access card. You know, so you and I can't go through. They've talked about it on campus for... Uh, student access to buildings, you know, because with some of the recent events in, in the country, they're more concerned about who has access to buildings, even though this is a public campus. It's only sort of public, you know. So who's allowed in a dorm, for example, after hours? Well, I could conceivably code that in your racer card, an RFID, and control who that is by your M number. They're not doing it now, but that's one of the things you can do. UHF, uh, better range. This is the kind of stuff you see used for uh, inventory control and warehouses and stuff. You'll have a reader mounted at the, on the front of a forklift, for example, 
and it can read the contents of pallets as it goes up and down. You, you've seen these forklifts in these huge warehouses that, you know, go up 15, 20, 30 feet. Yeah, I have a pick list. I'm the operator on a forklift. I have a pick list. I'm looking for a particular power. I know where it should be, <laughs> but I get there and I run the forklift up and I can read if it's actually in the spot where it should be. Lift it up, bring it down. Um, getting on up into the microwave range, this is probably where your car devices work. You could do it either way. Probably they work in the microwave range. Um, you can put a lot of information in those. At this, at microwave rates, remember that we've said all things being equal, higher frequencies will support broader bandwidth paths. So we can code a lot of information. We can move it pretty far because we have, at those frequencies, we have very efficient antennas relative to the 135 kilohertz level. Yes, sir? So, because like almost told, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Right. Um, it's uh, it's primarily range. Um, yeah. Well, remember, we're using very very small amounts of power. With low power, I have to overcome path loss, which is higher at those frequencies, right? Because path loss is frequency dependent. I can get more antenna gain at those frequencies than I can at lower frequencies in a small package. Most people aren't going to want for the, uh, the example used was uh, the toll pass things where you just drive through and you don't really have to stop the toll. You know, people will mount this thing in their window. They're probably not going to do it if they have to mount that and an outside antenna. Even though it would do the same thing, they're probably not going to do it so that you can get more antenna gain built into that physical package at those frequencies because antenna size is dependent on frequency. Excuse me. I misspelled vehicle, but anyway, <laughs> that's what happens when I type fast. Um, <laughs> yeah, I grew up in West Kentucky. I know how to spell. So again, you can combine the frequency you choose, the type of data that we're putting, the amount of data, and tailor all this to a system that you need. Now, your book, I'm not going to read the book to you. You can do that easily. But your book goes through the standards organization that does that and talks about some of the other applications. So how does this actually happen? We know that we can do we can do it at all these different frequencies. We've talked about how the propagation changes and how our range changes and data rate changes. But how do we actually read things? There are a couple of ways. Um, inductive or magnetic coupling, they essentially do the same thing. They just physically accomplish it differently. The trick here is that you have a reader that puts out a relatively strong electromagnetic field. The transponder, remember we looked at it, had that large antenna area. That's, that's why the tags were physically pretty large with the wires wrapped around them, but the, even though the circuit itself was teeny. What happens is that electromagnetic field powers the device. And I can transfer data across that coupling. That's the difference between inductive or magnetic coupling. If it's inductive, I'm essentially using transformer action. I'm using the magnetic part of the electromagnetic field, and I'm just coupling transformer action across that. So as I move the, as I generate this electromagnetic field and it cuts these, it cuts across these wires, I'm generating power in that circuit. That circuit can vary. We'll talk about how in a second can vary the. Uh, can use that power and transmit back data using amplitude uh, shift keying. The coupling is just through that transformer action. Uh, I said magnetic, I'm, I'm sorry. 
Inductive uses transformer action. Magnetic coupling basically uses an antenna. It uses a ferrite core. It does the same thing. It just physically accomplishes the process differently. For in here, we'll call them both antennas. It's not uh, the difference to us doesn't matter right now. Both of these are very close field. This would be something like a card reader. I mean, we're talking about a, maybe a centimeter of reading difference. So I'm going to put a card in this. I'm going to take something and set it physically on the reader or at least in very close proximity. Um, some of the door access systems that don't work at a distance that you actually have to hold a card up against it would be this kind of reading. Um, so what do we actually do when we do that? Well, what we're doing, if we are using a tag that uses inductive or magnetic coupling, the electromagnetic field, when it cuts across these wires, induces energy in there. And most of these tags will store that energy and then use it to power the transmitter for, for a short time. What they're going to do is generate their own transmission back, and they're going to use amplitude shift keying. So I'm going to, the coding is more complex than this, but I'm going to show a 1 as the presence of a carrier and a 0 as the absence of a carrier. Now, the actual coding is more complex than that because to keep this thing powered, I've got to make sure there are a certain number of one of cycles that I always have energy in. So they use more complex coding schemes than that. For our discussion, we'll, we'll just assume it's, it's that kind of simple on-off thing. This would be 100% modulation. I'm going from full power carrier to no power. Um, the advantage is this is really easy for the receiver to read. You know, <laughs> is it there, is it not? The disadvantage is this actually doesn't propagate well. It doesn't travel very far at all. and it's harder to turn, I've mentioned this before, it's harder to turn a carrier all the way off than it is to reduce its power. So what, typic, so what you can do is vary that. We're still using amplitude shift keying, but I'm just varying the power level. And what I'm actually doing is running a transmitter, and then I'm varying the load on that transmitter circuit. If I put more load on it, I'm switching a resistor across it, basically. With more load, I get a lower amplitude because some of the power is used up in that other part of the load that I switch in. If I switch out the resistor, more current goes through the antenna and I get a higher pulse. So I'm just switching a load in and out of uh, that circuit. The bottom picture shows 10% modulation, meaning I would shift this between full power and 90% of full power. In reality, most systems are going to fall between these two extremes, and you'll almost never see 100% modulation. So where is it going to fall? I don't know. What are you trying to accomplish? You know, typically, this is not something the end user decides. This is something the manufacturer decides in circuit design. But that's why different systems behave differently and have different ranges. Okay. Oops, accidentally hit this too, one time too many. Backscatter coupling is the other one that you see. And backscatter is one of those things that can be a little tough to, to understand. Backscatter, the reader sends a continuous wave. It's not a pulse. You know, in this one, it's half duplex. I send a pulse, the transponder talks back. In backscatter, the reader is continuously sending an RF wave. And what the tag does is reflect some of that energy back. OK, great. How do we encode it? I do it by changing the amplitude. I can, I can in the tag, I can do that same varying of the load to change the amplitude of the energy that's reflected back. Now realize the difference between the two. In this kind of system, the tag is actually generating a new transmission. It gets a pulse in, it sends back a separate pulse. Okay. In backscatter, I'm sending a continuous transmission from the reader, and the tag is simply modifying that energy and sending, sending it back towards the transmitter. It can be a little hard to picture, so let me give you an analogy. 
If I want to send, if I have a flashlight and you're at some distance from me and I want to send a message to you, the easiest way I can do that is point it at you and switch it on and off. Use Morse code or something like that. How do you send a message to me if you don't have a flashlight? Hmm? Okay, yeah, what I can do is I can take a mirror, you, you take a mirror, I shine the light at you continuously, and you simply change it to vary the amount of energy that comes back to me. That's basically how backscatter works. I want to be real careful how I answer this. <laughs> yes, sort of. Radar, work, radar does work by sending a continuous wave or a pulsed wave continuously, and it extracts information in a passive radar system. It extracts information based on parameters that have changed. Frequency, if you're talking about Doppler radar, is related to speed time that it takes for the return echo to come back is related to distance. The difference is the object that you're tracking in radar is not actively changing that. You know, it's not, it's not encoding information with the change. It changes it by simply existing. In this case, the tag is actively controlling how that return signal is changed. Okay. It accomplishes it basically the same way. I have the antenna and the tag, and I vary the load on that antenna on the tag side. The same thing. If I set the load so I have higher current through the antenna, I s more signal is returned. If I set the load where I use up some of that current in a resistor in the load, for example, in the tag, then I send less signal back so I can accomplish amplitude shift keying. You okay with that? Okay. So, when we're looking at a system, you know, you've got basically the tag, I mean, you've got different physical packaging, but you've basically got the same thing in all of these. You have a very small circuit, a very large antenna capture area, and this one, there's the, that's the tag, the little black dot in there, and the out, the uh, wiring around the outer rim is the antenna. In the middle picture, the black dot is right there, right above the tip of the thumb, and you can see the antenna going out around the edges. In the far right picture, with the grain of rice to show you how big it is, the chip is down in the middle, and you can see the antenna wrapped around the outside. The circuits are all basically equivalent. What we've changed is the packaging to accomplish whatever task we're trying to do. On the far left is something that we might put in a library book. If you go over to the library and ask to see how their tracking system works, they'll show you something that looks very similar to that, and they typically put it in, you know, somewhere inside a book where you can't see it, but it's in there. The middle one is the kind of thing that you would use on, say, a prescription bottle or something where you already have products in that I need to attach the ability to track. And so I'm going to you know, print a label that has information and I'm going to encode that on a tag or at least associate it with a number on the tag. The far right is the kind of thing that I would embed. You know, so if you're James Bond, I'm going to shoot that under you and, and in their technology it's going to send all my vital signs and communication and everything through a satellite. Yeah not. <laughs> what we're going to do with that is put that tag under the skin of, say, an animal, human if you wanted, and we're going to make it so that that identity is simply traveling with the person because it's embedded under the skin or with your pet or farm animal or whatever you're talking about. That would be a good application for writing data to that chip. Memory is very cheap. It is physically very, very small, and it's pretty easy to write. So that gets us to the idea of what kinds of things should we put in there. And I gave you the thought of medical records last time. From a technology point of view, it wouldn't be a, 
hard thing to put medical records in. There would be a limit to how much I could fit in there. But it wouldn't be a hard thing to put in. And I can certainly if you read through the charts and see the band, the data bandwidths that are available. I can get a lot of useful, I can get a useful amount of data in and out of this thing in a reasonable amount of time. So I could carry my medical records with me. The problem is these systems, from the tag's point of view, are passive. You know, the tag doesn't initiate contact. The reader does. And I might not always know where a reader is. That's why I don't use the uh, RFID-enabled credit cards. You know, I don't know, I don't have control over where the reader is. I can't tell where they are. And I know that the information, that that's information available to somebody that I might not want to give out, even though it's almost certainly not actually my credit card number and that sort of thing. It is a unique identity of that card and me as a user, which is more than I want to give away. So those kind of thoughts you have to think through. Um, where are we? What time is it? I didn't bring my. I'm sorry. Oh six. Okay. So yeah, we'll be we'll finish a little bit ahead of time. So thinking through what we talked about today, you're going to choose a combination of frequency, reading technology, data format, if you will, to meet the needs of your application. You know, if I'm simply identifying cows. I don't know why I like, I like using cows for this better than anything else. If I'm simply identifying cows in a herd, I really don't need that much information. I just need a unique identifier for that. No big deal. If I want to store the kind of data we talked about before, weight history, vaccinations, that sort of thing, then I need a more complex tag, and I need more complex systems behind this to be able to write that information. Okay. So what I'd like you to do, we'll get out of here a little bit early. What I'd like you to do is think through these other three pictures that I show. One of them is tracking uh, medicine dispensing in a hospital. One of them is tracking runners in a marathon or something like that where, you know, I'm interested in, in the hospital, I'm interested in making sure that the right medicine gets to the right patient and is recorded properly. In the case of a race, I'm interested in making sure that I track times of a runner accurately and that I know, you know for example, how many start, how many finish, how, how they are progressing through a marathon. And in an inventory system, how might I use that in a large warehouse environment? And just kind of think through that. Um, I'm going to do What I, what I intend to be a fairly quick, um, I, I really owe you guys a project. I'm going to do what I intend to be a quick, not hugely in-depth project based on this. I'm going to get, basically get you to think through a solution on this that will choose frequency, data format sort of. You know, I'm not asking to go down the bit level. But to describe the system using this and to choose between those parameters. Okay. It's not anything like what we did with the other one because you're less likely to do that this kind of work than you are the other we did. Um, I will have the exercises and quizzes up for this. Um, I'll make them due uh, Monday morning at 8. I would like you to read the, the uh, chapter, and I'll, I'll list out the two or three chapters we're going to use, but I would like you to read the... Uh, Let's see, I'm going to make sure I say this right, because if I try to use my memory, it won't work. I'd like you to read Chapter 7 by Monday as well. Okay? See you guys.